there are many treatments for prostate cancer, and one of them is radiation therapy. And even within radiation therapy, there's all sorts of treatments for prostate cancer. One of them is stereotactic body radiation therapy, SBRT, also known as CyberKnife. Today, we're going to talk to an expert, Jonathan Haas, Dr. Jonathan Haas from NYU Langone, Long Island, as to why SBRT might be a good option to treat prostate cancer. Let's go. All right, John, thanks so much for being on the podcast. I couldn't be happier and more honored than to have you on, John. Thanks so much. In the middle of your clinical day, is it not? It is, but yeah, this is an honor. When you, when you called me and invited me so graciously to be on the show, I would do anything for you. So this is an honor for me. It could be anytime you want, I'm here for you. And, and thank I appreciate you. it, brother. There's already an intro uh, before, so we, we're going to go right into it. I'm always interested why we do what we do and why you guys do what you do. What got you, first of all, into medicine, then into radiation oncology, and then specifically for focus in prostate cancer, what, what, what happened? How did that come about? It's a, I could probably spend the whole hour boring you, but <laughs> um, basically, so I come from a family of uh, dentists and physicians. So my dad's an orthodontist mm-hmm. um, and I was actually going to take over his dental practice. That's what I thought mm-hmm. I was going to do. Was he uh, disappointed? So, <laughs> well, so it's no, I think at the end of the day, we both did better. Um, yeah. So what happened was I went to Harvard Dental School. And the first two years at Harvard, you actually spend in the medical school. So you do your just one class. So I actually fell in love with the medicine. So it never occurred to me to be a physician. But once I got kind of deep into the medicine, I fell in love with it. So what I decided to do was to do, I did a cancer research fellowship at the National Institutes of Health between my second and third Mm -hmm. year of medical school. Um, And I worked in the lab of cellular oncology under Dr. Doug Lowe, who is now the the acting director of the NCI. And I chose that lab because it had a regular basketball game. That's the only reason I chose it. So I, I, I played basketball for Cornell, but they had a regular game. So oh, you I'm like, did? This, I didn't know that. This, this Actually, is the that's interesting. Yeah. You, you played ball for Cornell? I did. Um, I was a walk-on. So, uh, yeah, there's a there's a big need for six good Jewish point guards. You didn't know that? <laughs> well, that's... Sort of. That's uh, I was you're, thinking. Was like, I didn't connect under, those dots. Very underrepresented, so I filled that quota. <laughs> so, so, but that's why I pick. That's why I picked the lab. So, out of that lab, actually came Gardasil, which is the cervical vaccine lab. So, yeah. I worked. You know, I worked on a human papillomavirus. So, I finished the. You know, so, I ended up going to. So, Harvard won't let you transfer into the medical school. So, I, I ended up transferring to Wash U in St. Louis as a third-year medical student. Mm-hmm. They took all of my credits, and I thought I was going to be an oncologist. I thought medical oncology, because my grandmother had colon cancer, and Wash U has an enormous radiation oncology department. So I kind of wandered down there one day, my third year, and as you know me, I'm very subtle and meek. Um, right. So I found this super charismatic radiation oncologist named Perry Griggs. I just kind of walked mm-hmm. over to him. I said, mm-hmm. hey, my name is John Haas. I'm a third-year medical student. I'm interested in cancer, and I have no idea what you people do. That's exactly what I said to him. So he was like a big Midwestern cowboy. He puts his arm on my shoulder. He says, son, why don't you spend some time with me? So I actually gave up my Christmas week vacation, third mm-hmm. year, and I spent a week with him. And what I loved about radiation oncology is you really become a specialist in everything. So, you know, in room one, you may be a head, because radiation goes to all parts of the body. So in room one, you may be a head and neck surgeon. Room two, you may be a pediatrician. Room three, you may be a prostate specialist, urologist. Mm -hmm. Room four, you may be a gynecologist. So I love the fact that you got to do a little bit of everything. And as you also probably know, I have a very short attention span. So you just, all the cases are really quick. You get to go to the operating room. Back then, we did a ton of prostate seat implants. They took 45 minutes. We did the cervical brachytherapy. Brachytherapy is the, is the surgical implantation of radiation. So, you know, I did cervical brachytherapy. So I just kind of fell in love with the field. So to just make sure it was right, my fourth year, I rotated through, you know, some of the best places in the country, Memorial, Penn, which is where I ended up doing my residency, a couple other programs. I ended up going to the University of Pennsylvania 
for my residency. As it turns out, my uncle's best friend, so my mom's family's from Philly. My uncle's best friend was actually the residency director at Penn. Wow. Right. So I went there to interview. They saw that I had done bench work with the papillomavirus. I had a family connection to Joel Goldwine, who was the uh, residency director. He said, listen, I'm going to look out for you. You're, you're Harold's son. It was like a nice connection. So I did my residency at Penn, did my PGY year. My, you have to do a prelim year. So I did my first year at Winthrop, which is now NYU Long Island. Right. Course, I grew up on Long Island. And now we're part of the NYU family, which has been fantastic. But this was 25 years before that. At what point did you say, uh, you know, prostate cancer is where it's because I, am I wrong to believe that you primarily do prostate cancer, maybe solely prostate cancer? Now? So right, so back then, right now, I'm probably 80% prostate, about 10% breast. And then I get the occasional VIP or something that wants something else. Back then, so radiation oncology in general is you can do everything. And I still can do everything. I take regular calls. So whatever comes in, I deal with. Now I'm like 80% prostate cancer. So I came back to Long Island. I started radiation oncology at Winthrop. I was the junior partner. We were two doctor practice back then. And I did a little bit of everything. And then we were big, big prostate brachytherapy practice. We did tons of So brachytherapy for the listeners, those also referred to as seeds. Yeah, seed so brachytherapy brachy is, brachy is the Greek word for short distance. Mm -hmm. um, so brachytherapy means applying radiation at short distances from a tumor. Right. So I was a proctor for Bard, which is the company that makes the seeds. I used to travel all over the country and teach people how to do seeds. Mm. And then basically what happened, this is our story of, of CyberKnife. So in 2005, mm. 31 of our urologists decided to kind of open their own radiation facility. And they were predominantly at our hospital. So we lost all of our prostate cancer patients or the majority really kind of in November of 2005. Simultaneously, CyberKnife, which is a form of radiation, we can talk about that in more depth, that delivers what's called prostate SBRT, stereotactic body radiation therapy, SBRT, it was a newer company. So they, you know, we had decided to purchase a CyberKnife. We initially bought it for brain tumors. CyberKnife was invented by a neurosurgeon named John Adler, who I'm still friends with, who's a super charismatic neurosurgeon have you ever have a chance to meet him geo he's amazing oh and i hope he, i hope so and and maybe at the uh, does he, he show up at the conference uh he's been in our conference he just radiates electricity he's brilliant so he invented the cyber knife for brain tumors so we got it for brain tumors but then it, how it's funny how circumstance can make a career there was a radiation oncologist named jay friedland from uh, tampa tampa florida who ironically and sadly died of uh, metastatic cancer. I think it was either renal cell cancer or sarcoma. Oh, but he okay. was giving a talk on a medication called amifostine. Amifostine is a drug that was designed by the military to kind of protect against radiation. And they were using it at the time for head and neck cancer to kind of protect the salivary glands. He had a side project to look to do SBRT and amifostine with this new machine called CyberNet. And at that point, no one was really doing it. It was considered... Mm heresy. But since we bought the cyber knife and since the biology of prostate cancer, and we can talk about this if, in, in depth if you want me to, the biology of prostate cancer supports giving larger fractions of radiation over a shorter period of time, which is what SBRT is designed to do. And no one was really doing it, but we knew you know, physiologically or bio, you know, biologically that that made sense. So we knew about the amifostine, we had the CyberKnife, so we decided to start a CyberKnife prostate cancer program in 2005. Mm. And as you know, it exploded. So we were one of yeah. the early, it was just, you know, it was luck and had Jay Friedland's airplane not gotten delayed by a rainstorm, who knows um, if we would have done it. Uh, right, so that's, a, that's how it happened. And it just exploded and we saw that it worked and we've become the largest prostate SBRT cyber knife department in the country. And, you know, we, we, as we talked about before we came on air, we train people in this and not just cyber knife. I mean, SBRT in general, we're platform neutral. You know, we have fantastic doctors that use different platforms. So the, the, the biology works, we're just partial to one, but it works. So that's really how, how I started my career, how I ended up in medicine how I ended up being a prostate specialist. Um, we've gone from two doctors to six. Mm. We've gone from one office to three. We're now 
thrilled and grateful to be part of the NYU Langone family, which, as you know, was named the number one we're health ranked, system. We're, we're, yeah, we're, we're ranked, ranked number one in now. New York and number three in the country. The cancer program's top 20. It's been a win on every level. I was fortunate enough to recruit your mutual friend, Aaron Katz, to join me. Yeah, you know, Winthrop, now NYU Long Island, um, 10 years ago. So to have him as my wingman and me being his, it's just been the perfect program. And you've been a part of this. You know, I, I fully buy into you know, holistic medicine, all of our patients, you know, we, we've had the privilege of working together also for 10 years. You're predating your coming to NYU. I, and, I think and we I get it. Correct. That's unbelievable. So we've actually yeah. known each other for over, yeah. over a decade. I think it was, um, was it a talk that I gave? Uh, with, it, was for, a, it was a I, men's health seminar. It was back in the right. men's health seminar. Every, so every Father's Day, you know, we have a, what's called the men's health seminars for it's, it's always Father's Day, Saturday, the day before Father's Day. And, and it's, it's a health seminar, not just prostate cancer, although a focus is on that, but yeah. it's designed, you know, men are lousy patients. I'm the worst patient. I'm so <laughs> overdue right. for colonoscopy. I don't even want to tell you, but we're, we're, we're lousy patients. Your women are great. Yeah. Women yeah. go with the you know, men, we're, we're lunkheads right? You know, as a, as a race or as a species. So we decided to have a, a men's health and as Aaron's, Aaron's course, we have a men's health seminar where we focus on prostate and heart and health and diet. So you gave a fantastic talk on holistics and I just listened to it and, you know, independent of prostate cancer, I'm like, this makes sense. I mean, it's yeah. kind of how I live my life, but you know, to be taught that and you really stay away from, you know, stay away from vegetable oil, stay away from starches. Don't, you know, not completely stay away from cured yeah. meat. You know, yeah. olive oil as opposed to vegetable oil, red wine, you know, you know, brown grains, you know, yeah. fruits and vegetables. We, we, we definitely <laughs> hit it off after that. We're going to get into it. We have mutual patients where, you know, they've done the SBRT and aggressive lifestyle interventions, and these patients are doing amazing. Before we go into SBRT and uh, go uh, deep into that, give us a general overview on radiation therapy how does it work? Yep. There are so many different types now. Yep. I know you mentioned uh, fraction. Give us an idea what that actually yeah. means and the units that are used graze and how does it work with prostate cancer? So let me let me kind of take two steps back for the audience. So oncology in general consists of three major disciplines. You have medical, medical oncology who does chemotherapy, surgical oncology who kind of cut and radiation oncology who give radiation to tumors. So the way that radiation works in general, it's very precise, high dose particles of energy or radiation beams that interact. They kind of work on the cellular level. They damage the DNA of cancer cells. So a cancer cell divides more rapidly than a normal cell. That's what cancer is. It's unregulated growth of normal cells. They just, you know, the switches go off for various reasons. So radiation kind of damages the DNA. So where a cancer cell would otherwise divide from one to two, at that point, it would just die off. So that's the way the radiation works. It's, it's through an oxidative stress process, is it not? Well, the, yeah, you've done your homework. That's exactly right. It reminds me when I gave that talk at your seminar, right? Because I, I felt like I threw myself at the wolf's mouth. You're great. Right. So this is a group of radiation oncologists uh, from all over the country. And here oh, I am. Well. I'm talking about why actually dietary supplements are OK. And here's the evidence to show that and, and, and why perhaps an antioxidant from food or even a supplement may protect healthy cells. That's the goal. The goal right. is to target the cancer cells, kill off the cancer cells, but protect the healthy cells. And so... A lot of pushback that I've gotten, but everybody was so receptive to that conversation. It is, well, if antioxidants protect cells against oxidative stress, then it may protect cancer cells against oxidative stress, which has been a theory that's never been proven or disproven. And I've always thought it was a, 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 a wonky theory to, to begin with. So that's why honing in on, yeah, the way radiation therapy works is through oxidative stress. I quote you like every day. So it's funny. So <laughs> from this, so I'm not kidding you. So, 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 so you're correct. So radiation, what it does is it, it kind of breaks apart water molecules. You know, the bodies, the, our bodies are majority water and it creates these hydroxyl free radicals. So it's the free radicals that damage the DNA, of the cancer cells. 
and to your point, the antioxidants take away the free radicals. So yeah. there's a theoretical opposite. But what you told me at that course, you know, yes, it's theoretical, but you'd have to eat about six pounds of antioxidants a day for to really make a difference, which no one is going to do. So that's why I don't right. find my yeah. patients anymore because of, because of what you told me at that course. That's right. And, and I think even Zalewski, I remember saying, well, you know, I, I'm going to let my patients take antioxidants. Now. I, like, I do the same I, thing I just, now, but you were the one because you said, listen, I'm like, unless you're eating six pounds of antioxidants a day, have at it. it. Exactly. And there might be protective benefits. Moving along. So for prostate cancer, we have external beam radiation. There's a few types of energy, you know, for EBRTs, typically 40 to 42 sessions. Serotactic body radiation therapy, SBRT, is about five. Why is that? What are the pros and cons? Let's just keep it simple. I know there's different types of radiation for prostate cancer, right. but EBRT, IMRT, and SBRT right. are the most common ones. So the way that radiation works for different types of cancers is something called an alpha-beta ratio, which in English means it determines how sensitive or non-sensitive a cell is, a different cancer is to radiation. So most right. cancer cells have what's called a larger alpha-beta. What that means in English, it responds better to smaller fractions of radiation given over a longer period of time. So that's why for head and neck cancer, for lung cancer, for bladder cancer, we'll give radiation over four to six, seven, eight, nine weeks because the biology of those cancers supports it, giving it over a longer period of time. Prostate cancer is unique and one of the few that has very low alpha beta ratio. So that means it responds better to giving a larger fraction of radiation over a shorter period of time. That's why SBRT, the stereotactic body radiation therapy is advantageous for prostate cancer in contrast to many of the other cancers that we treat. Excellent. So you can do SBRT because of its fraction. Yeah, so so what a fraction is, so, so right, so radiation, just again for the listeners, radiation is, is delivered in fractions or sessions of radiation. So let's say we give, you know, 35 fractions of radiation, your typical, your 35 sessions, your fraction may be 180 centigrade or units of radiation over the 35 days. When we do SBRT, we're giving larger fractions like 700 to 800 centigrade a day over five fractions. Radiobiologically, it's a similar dose, but you're, you're exploiting the biology of that particular cancer. And the treatment is for five days, convenient to the patient. Yeah. Let's talk about side effects a little bit, adverse events. So we know with yeah. EBRT, there's numerous things. Um, and EBRT is external beam radiation, typically, again, a 40 to 42 treatments. Um, there's problems to the bowels, problems to uh, the bladder, something called radiation cystitis. Um, sometimes even secondary cancers has been published. SBRT, wh what are the what are the adverse events from uh, SBRT to the prostate? So if you imagine that my fist is the prostate and my fingers are the bladder and this finger is the rectum, right? So the bladder sits on top of the prostate like a hat. The urethra goes right through the center of the prostate, kind of like the where the kind of the hole in my hand. Yeah. So the most common side effect of radiation is urinary frequency. Patients are going to be peeing a little bit more frequently temporarily. There's no way to avoid that because the urethra goes right through the center of the prostate, kind of like the hole in the center of a donut. It gets better over time. In 2% of patients with any radiation, it can become a chronic thing. You know, let's say six months afterwards, if the patient's urinating every hour and they're miserable, the urologist can do a small procedure called a green light, or they just do yeah. like a little rotor rooter to open up the prostate or open up the urethra. My father had it done several years ago for another reason, for PPH, mm -hmm. benign yeah. prostatic hypertrophy. And he joked that he got off the table and peed like a 20-year-old. Again, unlikely, but we tell our patients everything. There is a 5% risk of rectal bleeding. That's because the front wall of the rectum shares the back wall of the prostate. That's the whole reason why we can do a rectal exam and feel your prostate. That's easily fixable by a gastroenterologist. There's a 2% risk of bladder bleeding because the bottom of the prostate, the bottom of the bladder, like where my fingernails are, sits on top of the prostate, which is my fist like a hat. So the urologist can fix that. And there's a 25% risk of erectile dysfunction with SBRT. That's better than the other forms of radiation, which run upwards of 40%. And you can predict that since we're tighter with our margins, we're radiating less. Why is that? You would think that it's, is it hitting some of the uh, uh, nerves yeah, that innervate so, the so, penis? 
Well, so no, it's not so much the penis; it's the nerves and the blood vessels. So I get it. I'm a guy. So let's let's kind of dig deeper into ED, right? That's that's important to all of us. When I give the so, and, and a good surgeon will give like you know our, our fantastic surgeons at NYU, you know Herb Lepore, Anthony Corcoran, Samir, they're all wonderful. Their their number is about twenty five percent also, and you're not going to yeah. get a better number than that. So let's kind of dig deep into that. So prostate cancer is not a disease of nineteen year olds college kids that can go three times a night, right? It's a disease of men as they get into their fifties, their sixties, their 70s and lose some potency anyway. So half that number that I gave you is felt to be attributable to treatment. The other half is felt to be attributable to age. You know, just I mean, if you look at age match 75 year old men that don't have prostate cancer, right, a very significant percentage of them are going to have some erectile dysfunction just as a function of them not being 19 anymore. But there's medicines to help. I would typically say if you're not functioning well before prostate cancer treatment, it's not going to get better afterwards. If you no. do, if you are eight out of 10, nine out of 10 right. before you have a right. better chance. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. If you're better going and you'll be better going out, but there's medicines to help. That's why we always, we've always taken, and you know, this, we've always taken a collaborative, you know, that integrative approach to, to, to medicine. One of the things that we're, we pride ourselves on at NYU Long Island is that we decided pretty early on, you know, Dr. Katz and I, Aaron and I, to make this a collaborative process where you, you we're not siloed. You know, it's not like when you go into the radiation office and you get radiation, you go to the surgical office, you get surgery, you go into the cryotherapy office, you get cryo. So we have a policy yeah. that every time a patient is seen by a radiation oncologist, they're actually seen by the urologist at the same time. So we consider ourselves a three person team. It's the radiation oncologist, it's the urologist, and it's the patient as an equal member of that team. So we all work together. Yeah, that true integrative uh, uh, approach. And, 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 you, and you preach this too. I mean, you, you've been yeah. visionary on integrative you know, holistic health and it's it's great. From a curative standpoint, I think I read a study, a long-term outcomes from JAMA in 2019 that showed it was you know SBRT being favorable with men with low to intermediate disease. So let's break this down a little bit. SBRT from a curative standpoint Yes, we can treat men with low risk disease. Uh, let's just stick with the, uh, the MECO stratification risk for a second. Low risk, Gleason 6s. Intermediate risk, Gleason 7s. And Gleason 8 and above, higher risk. Who's the best candidate? Clearly, uh, we know low risk. Intermediate risk patients, are they good candidates? Higher risk, where are we with higher risk patients with prostate cancers? In my non-radiation oncologist mindset, I'm thinking a tumor is a tumor. I don't care if it's a Gleason 9, Gleason 6. If we zap it, we zap the tumor. The, the risk maybe is that if, if it's a Gleason 9, then there's probably other disease, micro disease somewhere else. So am I looking at it the wrong way? And again, who's the right patient for SBRT? Yeah, no, you're not looking at it the wrong way, but let's, you know, kind of expand on that a little bit. So let's, yeah. so you talked about the D'Amico stratification, which is a way that, you know, prostate cancer specialists kind of break cancer patients up into three groups, low risk, you know, Gleason score. So when the patholo when you have your biopsy done, the pathologist looks under the microscope and they give a number to the cancer cells from six to 10, yeah. with 10 being the angriest. Um, so low risk, as you correctly stated, is a Gleason six and a PSA less than 10. So you can, so the question is for low risk, you have to see, do they need to be treated at all? Right. Right. So, so, so many patients with low risk prostate cancer, you know, we put on surveillance or active holistic surveillance, right? Diet change, lifestyle change, they may never need anything. But to answer your question, so NCCN guidelines, which is the government, and ASTRO, which is our governing body, both of which list SBRT as standard of care for low and intermediate risk prostate cancer. They further expanded their guidelines within the last two years to include it for high-risk patients as well. So it's now become a standard of care for high-risk patients. You know, in for localized disease that yeah, there's so no you evidence. Yeah, have to stage that. the patient. So, you, so you, you, you hit the nail on the head for the high-risk patients. So when we see a patient, we stage them. What that means is we send them for you know, CAT scans, MRI scans, bone scans, newer advanced imaging like PSMA, PET scans, to make sure there's no spread. So if you have localized disease, meaning it hasn't spread beyond the prostate, it's now a standard for all three categories. I tend with the high risk though to be really careful. I have a low threshold to kind of include the pelvic lymph nodes when I treat because there is a 
probably an upwards of 15 or 20 percent chance that if these patients were to go to surgery and they did a lymph node dissection, even though you don't see it on imaging, they may have a cult lymph node. So I treat the majority of my patients with high risk with lymph node radiation also. But surely for low and intermediate risk, right out of the gate across the board. And for many high risk, it's also an option. Interesting. That's great to know. I was still under the mindset for low, you know, SBRT is good for low to intermediate, but I, I did read some things with for high. So it's good that you're it, it's uh, moving that support way. that. Yeah, it's moving that way. Who's not the right candidate for SBRT? Does it matter the location of the tumor? Is that Does that play a role? If there's a lot of positive cores, who's not a, the right candidate? Well, to, to quote myself, Right. You know, if you're a candidate for surgery, you're a candidate for CyberKnife or, or for SBRT, you know, platform independence. So if you're a candidate for surgery, you're a candidate for SBRT. So to answer your question, who's not a candidate for SBRT, patients that have kind of widespread metastatic disease, you know, they're, they're usually not candidates for anything local. All that's actually changing, too, because there's newer data showing that you're radiating low volume metastatic disease or radiating the prostate in the face of metastatic disease, there may be a benefit. It used to be patients with very large prostates were not felt to be ideal candidates for SBRT because of the potential risk of side effects. Although I was honored to publish a paper that was presented at one of our national meetings last year, looking at prostate uh, glands greater than 100 grams, what we call our mega glands. So my mm-hmm. colleague, John Collins at Georgetown had published a paper a few years back on prostate glands greater than 50 grams. Your average prostate is probably about you know, 20 to 30 grams or cc's. Right. So Sean had published a paper, which I edited for him on prostates greater than 50 grams. We actually published on greater than 100 grams. So, you know, so provided that I think the anatomy is favorable, meaning that there's not a small bladder on top of a big prostate and they're not super symptomatic with urinary symptoms going in, those patients now can be candidates. So really the majority of patients are candidates. You know, so location have, doesn't matter? Not for um, this, not so much, not so much because we're gonna treat you know, the entire gland anyway. Um, mm-hmm. I think that becomes more of an issue for some of the newer focal therapies that are coming out, you know, where if you have disease at the apex or the bottom of the prostate, you may not be a candidate for a focal therapy, but we do put a margin on it. So um, it's really not much of an issue for us. But I get that question often. Yeah. My un- understanding was that, again, non radiation oncologist, you do have the ability of, of doing, uh, well, let's take this back. SBRT, is it considered a focal therapy or does it depend on, it's not considered a focal therapy? It's a therapy. precise therapy. Uh-huh. Right. Focal means your focal means your radio, although we're, we're talking about opening studies for that. But f- a focal therapy means you're just irradiating a part of the prostate. Yeah. Right. So if you have disease at the right base only, right. you know, one small quadrant, you know, there are some people, including at our institution, looking at doing focal therapy, meaning treating just a small part of the prostate. Most standard therapies in the year 2022 are whole gland therapies. They treat the entire prostate. The advantage of SBRT in contrast to the other forms of radiation, which we also do, is that at the edge of the prostate, again, using my fist as the analogy of the prostate, where your normal anatomy is, the dose falls off so precipitously. That's why it's a better radiation treatment. Fascinating. So the the most common side effects that you see, negative side effects, are are because what I notice sometimes with patients, even I'm I'm oftentimes defending medicine, because obviously they come to me because they don't want any medical treatments. And I said, well, what have you read in the internet? So they read all the horror stories. And I said, look, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've never seen that. The top three are these for proxotectomy, blah, blah. What are the top three adverse events that you've seen from uh, SBRT? Well, most patients have short-term side effects. The short-term side effects that people don't love are urinary frequency and rectal urgency. So a feeling like you have to pee and a feeling like you have to have a bowel movement. That peaks about a week to 10 days after you're done and then it gets better. So those aren't really a big deal other yeah, than yeah. you know, knowing that you have to go to the bathroom for a couple of weeks. To answer your question, the longer term side effects, the ones that we don't love. So there's that 5% risk of rectal bleeding that requires an intervention. You know, a gastroenterologist has to go up there with the colonoscope and either with the special enema or lasers or a chemical fix the bleeding. There's a 2% risk of bladder bleeding. Again, that's something that might require an intervention by the urologist or hyperbaric oxygen. You know, the impotency rate, you know, the 25% is a real number. You know, so that 
guys don't like that, which is understandable. Those are the major adverse events, but we counsel those patients, you know, when we see them in consultation, we talk about it, you know, they, it's informed consent. You know, patients understand that these side effects can occur. One of the mentors that trained me, Eli Glassstein, who I love, passed away several years ago, said, you have to be a long-term survivor to have long-term issues with therapy. And if you don't want to give side effects, then don't cure the cancer. Right. That's a so very interesting any doc, point. Any doctor that tells so you I, this I, is I, good, so. Things are changing. The trends are changing. I think that in my mind, my research and study with aggressive lifestyle interventions, the goal, and I, I am on this anti-aging longevity tr track as well, for men yeah. particularly. The goal is how do we live better with age? So uh, I, I really want it all. I really want, and by the way, I see it with our, with our patients, 70 years old. Wow, I feel even more, I feel better than when I turned 60. I, I've heard the same thing from an 80 year old that feels better than when he turned 70. So I'm hoping <laughs> that we can, we can figure this out better from a, again, an integrative holistic perspective and, you know, have us live longer so you can enjoy your great grandchildren and sit down on the floor and actually play with them and be able to get up. I agree. I mean, you know, again, back in you and I are contemporaries, right? Back in the day when we were kids, you heard the, the C word. And it was almost like it was a death sentence. Yeah. And now it's become almost like chronic illness, like really no different than hypertension or, you know, coronary artery disease, high cholesterol, you know, cancer, you know, not all cancers, obviously, but many of the cancers that we see now, you know, it just becomes hopefully not much different than you know, checking your PSA is really no different than checking your cholesterol. After being treated, something you manage right? and... Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. John, I think those are my main questions. What, what else have I should I ask that I haven't asked in terms of you know our audience? Well, there are lay people, but some, a lot, there's a lot of healthcare practitioners who are non neurologists, non radiation oncologists. So, sure. what else you want to share? And you, what final thoughts yeah. do you have? I think, you know, cancer. I think that someone that's newly diagnosed, right, should, should not just seek one opinion. This is one of the few diseases in oncology, you know, where you have the luxury of time to do your homework. So if there's internists, you know, out there or lay people out there, you know, counsel your patient to seek multiple opinions, right? Don't just go to a radiation oncologist. Don't just right. go to a urologist. Don't just go to, you know, just make sure you seek multiple opinions. Never, in my opinion, should you go to someone that's kind of forcing you into one treatment and scaring you away from the others. You know, go to a place where it's integrative, yeah. holistic, where you're going to have a team looking out for you. So that's hugely important to me. And I know you preach that, Gio. Make sure you go to a place that publishes their own data, right? You know, go to a place that, you know, they, you know, we, we work in Manhattan, right? There's fantastic medical institutions on every corner. So publish your own outcomes. Go to a place that they don't want to know what you know, Dr. X at the Mayo Clinic can do if they're in New York, they want to know what John Haas, you know, what, what Dr. Geo can do. And, and we all publish and, and lecture on what we do here. It's easier for patients to get on a subway and go 20 blocks up and go to a different institution. So why should they come to us? So be comfortable in publishing your own outcomes. For the internists out there, to answer your question, you know, I'm still a huge proponent of PSA. Me you know, too. several years back, you know, there were the guidelines that came out from the Preventative Service Task Force questioning the utility of PSA. I don't doubt that, you know, so so the issue always, you know, the criticism was, you know, that we're, that we're tr over treating patients. That doesn't mean we shouldn't screen them, right? The issue is not who should be diagnosed. The issue should be who should be, who should be treated. You know, many of the patients, I would say probably 25% of the patients that I see, including one this morning, I recommended, you know, active holistic surveillance. They're going to see Aaron. Um, and I've sent patients to you for that also. So don't throw away what has been the single most effective screening yeah. modality that we've had, I think, ever in oncology, right? Otherwise, the PSA, otherwise we'll be back in the 1960s and 1970s yeah. where we're diagnosing a third less cancers. But those that we do diagnose are stage three, stage four, they're four, bleeding, right. they're obstructed. So that's a huge take home message and, and something that's incredibly important to me and our patients. I, I agree. I always say it's not a matter of uh, whether or not we should use the PSA test. It's how to use it and how not to misuse the PSA test. Right. John, I, have, I do have one more for you really quickly. Yeah. Patient comes in. He had a prostatectomy. He has a recurrence, right, whatever age of the patient. Yep. We find out through technology and imaging that it's on a certain lymph node. 
can we treat just that one lymph node with EBRT and not remove that lymph node surgically if the patient yeah. doesn't want to re uh, undergo right. another surgical procedure? Right. So there's a there's a, an evolving body of data for patients that we call oligometastatic disease, meaning less than four sites of metastatic disease, using SBRT to just kind of focus on that one node um, or that one bone metastasis or that one you know small area in the rib. It used to be those patients were just you know placed on hormones, which meant hate. So yeah, we can totally do that. We do that all the time now. Excellent. What's a, now this is really the last question, John, what's considered recurrence after SBRT? What PSA number? What, you know, does it go back? Does it go, is the expectation is for PSA to go down to zero? What's the, what's the proper right. expectation after right. SBRT? So, 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 so PSA, as you know, which stands for prostate specific antigen. So PSA is not specific for prostate cancer. It's specific right. for the prostate itself. Right. So if you have surgery, your PSA should be zero because your prostate's out. With any other treatment, you're always going to have some PSA because PSA is not specific for prostate cancer. So the definition of when we start to worry, and it's not my definition, it's ASTRO, which is our governing body. It's called the Phoenix definition, like Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah. It's when yeah. you see a rise of PSA that's two full points above its lowest value after a year and a half. The reason why I put that year and a half caveat in is that, is that it's been very well reported on and published on, including by me, that you can get something called a benign PSA rise where the PSA drops, starts to rise again in the fall. It's thought to be due to something called apoptosis, which in English means a bunch of the normal prostate dies off late. So there's no such thing as a right number. There's a right trend. Um, but if you go to a radiation oncologist or a prostate specialist, they'll be able to interpret the PSA kinetics. Beautiful. John, how can people find you? Well, Thank you. So you obviously can Google. I'm Jonathan Haas, H-A-A-S-M-D at NYU. We have an easy phone number. It's 833-1-CYBER, O-N-E, C-Y-B-R. -E -Cyber, um, that's 1-833-663-2927. Um, so it would be my honor to see and help anyone that's out there. And we're, we're here for you. John, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. I hope to see you sooner. And I'll take you up on coffee or something uh, down you in- Get the air help. Yeah, right. That's right. Air hug. The air fist. <laughs> Take care, brother. I'll, I'll see you All soon. Right, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. Thank you.